بسم الله <coughs> بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومولاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah, fantastic. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to finish off this uh, surah, uh, surah sharh or surah al-inshirah, which has eight ayat. So we're only going to do the final two ayat, the two concluding ayat, which are commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala finishes off this surah with some commands to the Prophet after mentioning the great beautiful blessings that Allah Ta'ala has given him, which by the way, this is a, a quality that you should do when somebody is feeling depressed. And that's, this is what it seems to be. That this surah is all about comforting the Prophet So the first portion is about what? Saying, listen, didn't I give you all these great blessings? And then we talked about that in, in detail, about how this is comforting the Prophet from a depressing situation. Then the next portion is saying, yes, you're going through hard times, but hard times are going to lead to good times or with it. In the ma'al usr yusra, that even with the hard time, there is good inside of it. And then for every single hardship, there's going to be two eases and they're going to be open ended. So we talked about that in detail in Shalatara. So this is all a reassurance. But then after giving that reassurance, it's like, look, it's not enough to just comfort you, it's also to shake you out of your, let's say, sadness, depression, hardship. What am I going to do? I'm going to also redirect you and say, this is what you have to do. Instead of just focusing entirely on, you know, the things that are bothering you, remind you of your blessings, remind you that good things are on the way as well, that there's good in all of this ultimately, and then finally, this is what you need to be focused on. You need to change your mindset. You need to focus on something else and something good, inshallah ta'ala. So, what are the final two ayat? Allah ta'ala says, بَعْدَ عَوْذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Very simple, two beautiful ayat. <coughs> what is the first one? فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَ means so, so therefore, like it's, it's a sort of a concluding remark. Therefore, after knowing what you have known, it's interesting, actually one of the brothers mentioned it last week and I thought this was such an important uh, comment that we should, we should really appreciate it. That subhanAllah, sometimes a person is very complacent and Allah Ta'ala sends them some difficulty to shake them out of their complacency, right? And now that they're shaken out of their complacency, they're gonna push themselves harder. So what was the original problem? They were not taking advantage of their free time. Right? And so it's very interesting that Allah is saying, listen, with hardship comes ease. In other words, you're going through a hardship, but the idea is to shake you up and it's going to be of good benefit in the end. And how is that related to free time? فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ When you have free time, فَانْصَبْ Then, toil hard or stand up and worship or you know, uh, apply yourself. So the idea is what? That this is a reminder to all of us that sometimes you're a little bit too complacent. You're not utilizing your free time. It could be the case that Allah Ta'ala sends you a difficulty that at the moment seems very hard, but it's actually going to discipline you, make you a little bit tougher, and remind you, hey, I was wasting too much time. Now that I'm reminded of my blessings, now that I'm reminded of how life can be tough, this is going to kick me into gear, and I'm going to be more uh, uh, careful with my free time. So the correlation between the sixth ayah and the seventh ayah, you can appreciate that a lot, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. Very fascinating. Now, fa so fa means therefore, or so, Ida means when. Faragta. Faragta, what does farag mean? It means to be empty, right? And to means to be inversed or poured out. Now, this is really a, a, a beautiful concept and very difficult to achieve and something that we should all want to strive for. We should all want to strive for before we do insab, before we actually, you know, nasaba, uh, which is to stand erect and to uh, toil oneself. We'll talk into the, about the details. It means to be pegged into the ground. It also means to be tired and exhausted. So this can refer to you know, stand your ground and work hard at something. It could be referring to salah, but it could also be referring to working hard at something. And so this, it's open-ended. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ So that when you are free, you should, in sub, you should work hard and toil. Now, wh why is this so powerful? Because when you have the image of dumping something out entirely, the idea is Allah is commanding you to worship, but commanding you before you worship, I want you to be completely empty. Think about a cup that has liquid in it. You might pour a little bit out, but there's still some left. No, no, imagine, I want you to imagine dumping it and shaking it, making sure not even a single drop is left. And then Allah saying, that's how I want you to approach me. That's how I want you to come to salah. I want you to be completely empty, not a single drop left, focused on dunya, focused on money, focused on business, focused on... I want you to empty yourself completely. Now, is this something easy to achieve? I don't believe so. But that's not the point. The point is that this is a goal that we're always working towards. We're always trying to refine it. Trying to empty ourselves when we stand before Allah. Personally, I think even the motion, and this is, this is just sort of an, a personal observation, even the motion of making the takbirat, it's, it, it's almost as if, clear your mind. It really feels and looks like that. Whatever's in your head, throw it away. Throw it behind your back and think to yourself, 
Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than whatever I'm thinking about. Whatever is distracting me, Allah is greater than that. Now I can focus, right? What is the expression in Arabic when somebody wants, uh, excuse me, more, more specifically, in Egyptian, Let's, well, our Egyptian brothers are here, I'm sure. Uh, what is the expression in the Egyptian language when, uh, or in the dialect, in the, in the uh, lahja, in Amiya, when you want to say, be careful, watch out. What do they usually say? Khalibalik, what, more? Khalibalik? Min nafsik, thank you very much. Khalibalik min nafsik. This is actually a fascinating, a fascinating statement. Because we just think of it as watch out, right? But if you actually translate it word for word technically, khali means to empty. Khalibalik means your mind or your, your consciousness, whatever's going on in your mind. And it, uh, khali, uh, min, yeah, khalibalik, empty your head, min nafsik, of yourself. Get out of your own head. Get out of your own ego. Empty yourself of yourself. Empty your mind of thinking about yourself too much, right? Why? Because one of the greatest dangers that a human being can be is too caught up with their own, let's say, waswas shaitan, or, or let's say, or let's say, their own uh, desires, or their own worries, or their own thoughts, or plagued by the past, or their own anxieties. It's like, look, man, there's an expression even in English: get out of your own way. You know, get out of your own head for a second. Just look at the world as it is. Get out of your own head. Khali min nafsik, right? It's actually a beautiful statement. The idea of the, and, and you say this when a person is in danger, which is amazing because the, one of the most dangerous things you could be is what? Full of yourself. One of the most dangerous things you could be is too much in your own head. You got to empty all that out. That's the most dangerous state you could be. Isn't that a beautiful statement? So even though I may make jokes about, you know, or, you know, about the uh, lahja or the uh, dialect of Egyptians here and there because, you know, uh, you know I, I, I try to study fusha, <clears throat> and so it's not easy for me to know all the lahajat. But still, uh, uh, you can definitely appreciate this expression. It's very, very beautiful. And I think people say it, they just say it quickly without thinking about the depth of this statement. Okay, khair, inshallah. So this idea is, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ Get empty. Empty yourself. فَنْصَبْ When you finally achieve this ability to empty yourself and be free, then فَنْصَبْ Then you should peg yourself, plant yourself, exhaust yourself, tie yourself to the utmost, and so on and so forth. So, we're learning some very beautiful <clears throat> points here. This is often interpreted as Qiyam al-Layl. That the Prophet ﷺ, he would work during the day giving da'wah and Qiyam al-Layl was like recharging the battery. And why is that the case? Because subhanAllah, you're going from p talking to the people who like you the least, the people who dislike you the most, right? The Quraysh, many of them who, you know, uh, the, the majority being polytheists and opposing Islam. So you have to recharge your bat battery by what? Talking to the one who loves you the most. So you see the two, you need, you need the, 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 you know, to recharge your battery from that perspective. So, subhanAllah, this is important, uh, talking to us about the importance of standing at night, worshiping Allah, being close to Allah, thinking about Allah, making dua, and having this dhikrullah in your most private moments. And subhanAllah, uh, to make even our downtime, even our rest time as useful as possible. SubhanAllah. And this, by the way, is very similar to an example of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam was with, was speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a very interesting commentary that notices how he spoke a lot. And it looked like he was kind of going into a little bit too much detail. Allah ta'ala asked him, what is in your right hand? And he kind of just wants to keep the conversation going. So he's like, you know, I, he, he gave lots of answers. As the ayah mentions in Surah, al, surah al Taha, Allah mentions what? وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى قَالَ هِيَ عَصَايَ أَتَوَكَّوْ عَلَيْهَا وَأَهُشُّ بِهَا عَلَى غَنَمِ وَلْيَفِيهَا مَأَارِبُ أُخْرَى That he says what? And what is in your right hand, O Musa? And so he, instead of just saying, my staff, he says, it is my staff, I lean upon it, I bring down leaves for, for my sheep, and I have other uses too. Clearly, he had the desire not to just answer the question, but to continue the conversation. This goes to show his desire to keep it going. And then right after, soon after that, what happens? Allah mentions to Musa alayhi salam, اِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ فِرْعَوْنِ إِنَّهُ طَهَا Go to Fir'aun, he has transgressed. What is the implication? You speak to the best, you speak to the worst. So the Prophet ﷺ, you see this sort of balancing, this, 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 the, 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 this, this sort of, you could say, uh, oscillation between the two. And you see the same concept coming with Musa ﷺ as well, subhanAllah. So let's go get into the Aqwal al-Salaf. Let's take a look at what the righteous predecessors would say regarding this ayah. <clears throat> they would comment, إِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنْ جِهَادٍ مِنْ جِهَادِ عَدُوِّكَ فَانْصَبْ فِي عِبَادَةِ رَبِّكَ That when you are free from fighting your enemies, then focus on worship. So the believer, when he's being attacked, when the believer is in a state of warfare, obviously that becomes your priority. The moment you are free of this, if life is easy for you, if you're not in a state of war, then what should you be focusing on? Not 
uh, you should be focusing on jihad and nafs. You should be striving to improve yourself. That's one term. That's from Al Hassan and Zayd uh, ibn Aslam. Uh, then you have from Mujahid rahimahullah, he says, إِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنْ أَمْرِ الدُّنْيَا فَانْصَبْ فِي عِبَادِتِ رَبِّكَ وَصَلِّي That when you are free from the worldly work, then strive in terms of worship. Al-Kalbi says, إِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنْ تَبْلِيغِ الرِّسَالَةِ فَانْصَبْ أَيْ إِسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ That when you are free from conveying the message, when you are free from da'wah, then ask Allah to forgive you and, the, and to forgive all of the believers. From Qatad al-Muqatil and al-Dahaq, they say what? إِذَا فَرَغْتَ مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ الْمَكْتُوبَةِ فَانْصَبْ يَعْنِي إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فِي الدُّعَاءِ That when you are free from the obligatory prayers, then turn to your Lord in dua for extra you know, worship and so forth. So these are all different ways of appreciating the fact that Allah Ta'ala left it open. When you are free, free from what? Allah didn't mention. So you have various scholars saying free from, and they're filling in the blank. When you are free from that, فنصب, then strive. Strive for what? Allah left it open. So there's lots of different ways of appreciating this ayah, and all these different scholars are coming at, dip, coming at it from different angles. And look, it's not like they're contradicting one another. We can appreciate every perspective in the Allah Ta'ala. <clears throat> Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah says what? يَنْبَغِي لِلْعَبْدِ أَلَّا يَفْعَلَ مِنَ الْمُبَاحَاتِ إِلَّا مَا يَسْتَعِينُ بِهِ عَلَى الطَّاعَةِ He says that the slave of Allah shouldn't do permissible things except what will help him in obedience to Allah. This is the state of the believer. That look, even when it comes to the way you uh, spend your time in mubahat, in things that are mubah, things that are just, you know, they're not necessarily good or bad, they're just neutral. Even in those things, try to make it somehow good. So for example, what are you going to do in your free time? I like to play sports. Okay, good. Make your sport a sport something. Like for example, swimming could save your life one day. You know, something that's going to be, uh, make you healthier. Do it something that's going to create brotherhood. Do something that is going to improve your, I don't know, uh, skills and, and, and so on and so forth. Your, what's it called? Hand-eye coordination. So the idea is that instead of just making it mubah, like I'm just playing, Right? فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَلْعَبْ No, استغفر الله. That's not what the ayah says. Allah doesn't, didn't say, when you are free, go play. Allah says, فَنْصَبْ So, even in your ilab, even in your play, even in your play, what should you do? Try to make it something that is actually of merit and turn it into ibadah through your intention to make it good. Imam al-Shafi'i says, rahimahullah, beautiful quote, very famous quote too. As-sihhatu tajun ala ru'usil as-sihha'i wa la yaraha illa al-marda. That health is a crown on the heads of the healthy that nobody sees except the sick. SubhanAllah, you know, he says it very poetically. That health is taj, it's a crown on the heads of everybody that's healthy and they don't see that crown, it's, they're blind to it. The only people that see it are sick people. They look and say, look at that beautiful crown, I wish I had that. The, the healthy person doesn't even notice, right? So subhanAllah, this is something that gets overlooked. That never overlook your free time, never overlook your health. These are, this is sort of the implication here. Ibn Rajab, rahimullah, he has a nice quote in this regard. He says, Inna Allah idha taqabbala amala abdin wafaqahu li'amali li'amalin salihin Ba'dahu. That indeed when Allah accepts a slave's deed, then he grants him the ability to do more good deeds after it. So this, when you have this idea of فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ When you are free from doing whatever good you were doing, and then you still have the ability to do more good, then this subhanAllah is an indication that the, the first good was so accepted by Allah that Allah gave you more opportunities. So if you, so this is, uh, you know, obviously only Allah knows what he accepts and what he uh, rejects. Uh, I'm not the one to judge, we don't know. But if you want a good sign, if you want something that indicates, then inshallah when you do a good deed and you're more motivated to do it again, and it keeps on coming back again and again, inshallah ta'ala, this is indicating what? That it has been accepted. SubhanAllah, there's an interesting book called Die Empty. Unleash your best work every day. And one of the you know, sort of themes in it is this quote that says, the cost of inaction is vast. Don't go to your grave with your best work inside you. Choose to die empty. So every talent you think you have, every good idea you think you have, don't keep it to yourself. You know, subhanAllah, there are probably people in this masjid that they have beautiful ideas for this community. And they're just waiting. Did I pass away today? No. Let's see if I pass away tomorrow. Let's see if I pass away the next day. You just keep waiting. Why didn't you share that idea? Why are you going to take it to your grave? That means you're going to... How many good ideas are in the graves? How, how full are these graves with great, beautiful ideas that nobody shared? Why would you do that? Die empty. Make sure that any of your good ideas, you applied yourself. Any talent you had, any energy, extra energy you had, apply it. Why would you leave it in the tank? You know, what, what, you know it reminds me of you know, when, you, when you buy a rental car and they say, don't worry, you can bring it back empty. You know, people drive it to the very last drop. I'm going to take advantage to the last drop. You know, so this idea of why would I give back you know, some of the money that I spent? No, I'm going to use it to the last drop. So that's what we should do. We should die empty. 
Abu Sulaiman al-Darani, he says, Rahimullah, لا يصبر عن شهوات الدنيا إلا من كان في قلبه ما يشغله من الآخرة. Nobody is patient in resisting the temptations of this world except the one who has in his heart that which occupies him with the pursuit of the hereafter. It's a beautiful quote. That you're never going to be able to resist the shahawat, the desires of this dunya, except if you are فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ the moment you're free, you have your eye on the prize. You know that you want the akhirah. That's the only way you're going to be able to resist these shahawat. That's the only way you're going to be able to resist your most base desires. The only way you're going to break these chains of habit is if you are so desirous and so passionate and have such an aspiration for the akhirah that you can't imagine wasting your time with nonsense. And so with, you have to develop that love for Allah Ta'ala and for seeking the akhirah. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah has a beautiful quote. He says, that wasting time is worse than death. Think about that. Wasting time is worse than death. You might have to say, how? How can you justify that statement? His logic is actually quite impressive. He says what? That he says, well, wasting time, because wasting time cuts you off from Allah and the afterlife, which is the worst. I mean, being cut off from Allah and being cut off from the akhirah, that's the worst. However, Death just cuts you off from this dunya and its people. So dying, I just get cut off from this dunya. Who cares about this dunya? But wasting your time, this is cutting you off from Allah and your possible rewards in paradise. So which one's worse, being cut off from the dunya or being cut off from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So if it comes to death, I'd ra- so he's basically saying, I'd rather, be, I'd rather die than waste even a second. This is how much of a hustle mentality, subhanAllah, some of these people, this is how they became such prolific writers. You know, sometimes we look back at the salaf and you see that, oh, here's his book on the shelf. It's like, I don't know. How many volumes? You can't even count. It's so big. You're thinking, wait a second. Did he have an editor? Did he type it all? Uh, did, he, was, did he have Google searches? How did he? No, no, no. Everything with a pen and dipping it in the ink and writing. I mean, subhanAllah, how on earth did this man do this? Didn't waste a second. SubhanAllah. How much reading did it take? How much traveling did it take to read those books? He wasn't downloading PDFs. He had to go travel to get the books, make copies of it, give it back, say, now I have my own copy. Good. Now I can read it, understand it, memorize it, study it. And now I actually have some knowledge to actually write a book. SubhanAllah, and the whole process is incredible. Some of these people would spend so much time just binding. You know how long it took to bind back in the day? SubhanAllah, even that was such an ordeal. Nowadays, press print, everything comes out, no problem. Um, yes. So, an important quote that I think we should always remember is what? The statement, never be bored. Never be bored. It's, when somebody says the statement, oh, I'm bored, you should get offended. A little, I mean, <laughs> don't get mad, but you should be a little bit offended. Because indirectly, they're kind of making a statement. What are they saying? They're saying, I'm bored and the world should fix it. I'm bored and it's you people's job to entertain me. There is that subtle implication that I'm bored and somebody should do something to change my state. Why are you announcing to the world that you're bored? If you're bored, get up and do something. Learn something. Find, Find a problem and fix it. Make the world a better place. Announcing to the world that you're bored, what are you expecting to happen? What does that mean? Oh, I'm so bored. Why are you telling us? What, do you, what, do you, what, what, is, what is this exchange of information producing exactly? So there, is, there does seem to be a certain level of entitlement that can come, that can come, I'm not saying in every instance, but it can be implied there. That's very, very dangerous. You should be very careful to never express that statement because that's your problem if you're bored. If you're bored, get busy. Figure your life out. Don't just announce it proudly that you're bored and expect the world to change it for you. That's, uh, you know... Um, uh, not appropriate. There's a nice quote that says, "If you're bored, don't seek diversion. Seek, but uh, don't seek diversion, but devotion." It's a nice quote. So uh, uh, don't seek diversion. Like, oh, I'm bored, so I'm going to entertain myself. No, seek devotion. Figure out something that you're passionate about. And Subhanallah, we should make a list. When you have free time, it could be the case that you don't feel like one kind of worship. Like, for example, if I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, when you're free, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْصَمْ, get busy in some kind of ibadah, and you're thinking, man, I'm so tired after work. I don't feel like standing in salah. Okay, fine, but. Toil or work hard doesn't necessarily mean salah. So if you actually are diligent enough to say, these are the type of things I like. Yeah, maybe salah is one, but maybe just dua is another. Maybe dhikrullah is another. Maybe listening to a good lecture is another. And so on and so forth. You know what? Maybe calling a friend that I haven't spoken to in a long time. That's a form of ibadah. Reconnecting to people I have ignored for a long time. That's something I could do after work when I'm feeling a little bit you know, uh, bored and feeling a little bit tired. Maybe I can give somebody a call, somebody that'll cheer me up. So when you make a list and think about the things that you would have otherwise not thought about, then you can look at that list and say to yourself, this one fits my mood. This one, I actually feel like doing. That way you never, you never waste a second, inshaAllah ta'ala. Next ayah, what Allah said, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Now the expected sentence is what? 
فَرْغَبْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ That's, you know, the, the expected sentence is switched around. It's, that means فَرْغَبْ So uh, what is uh, إِرْغَبْ إِرْغَبْ or رَغَبَ means to either long for something lovingly if it's رَغَبَ إِلَىٰ but if it's رَغَبَ عَنْ it means to turn away from and get away from something. So obviously there's an إِلَىٰ that has been مُقَدَّمَة it has been advanced. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ Right? So it does have the إِلَىٰ but it's been advanced. Why? Because this when Allah Ta'ala switches the order, the implication is that it's لِتَخْصِيص It's for specification. This is a type of longing that is not for anybody else. That turn to your Lord, so that if you want to translate the ayah, Allah's, uh, the ayah is what? And to your Lord, direct your longing. To your Lord, and because it's advanced, it's implying what? In a way, like to nothing else. Nothing else should have this level of devotion. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ Specifically to your Lord, this type of devotion, فَرْغَبْ You should have that passion and that desire. So the first thing, is that what? This could refer to any type of ibadat, right? Anything that is actually considered worship, anything that is good. There's lots of good quotes here from uh, some classic American quotes here. Benjamin Franklin said what? There will be, there will be plenty of time to sleep when you, when you are dead. <laughs> that's a good quote. <laughs> so in other words, hustle. You know, there's plenty of time to sleep when you're dead. I thought that's a good quote. Another one is from Theodore Roosevelt. What? We must all either wear out or rust out. Every one of us. My choice is to wear out. That's a really nice quote. You either have to wear out or rust out. What is the implication here? Ride it till the wheels crack, as in hustle and hustle and hustle until you break down, or sit back, do nothing, and just rust away. Either way, you're going to break down. So what do you want to do? Do you want to wear out or rust out? And he says, I choose to wear out. In other words, I'm going to keep pushing myself until my battery runs out, until I die. So these are some nice quotes in the idea of what? Push for that which has value, that is, you know, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa something good. Yes. Yeah, and, and by the way, this is, this is something that's true for all athletes as well. I mean, think about top athletes. And you say to them, how do you train so many hours a day when your body can only handle so much physical training in the day? Other, other than that, your body's going to break down. They say, oh yeah, I do my physical training until my body can't handle it. Then what do I do? I study my opponents. I watch old tapes. I figure out what they're doing right, what I'm not doing. So don't always think in a, in a unidimensional perspective. Don't always think from one you know, sort of narrow-minded uh, way. You always have to try to think of, okay, how can I diversify? Yes, it's also interesting. Wa ila rabbika farghab. This wa uh, could indicate a separate thought, as in the first thought, meaning that there's not a condition that when you're free, rather you should have longing for Allah in all circumstances, in all times, and in all places. And uh, uh, Subhanallah. So, so the idea is wa ila rabbika farghab to your Lord. You should have longing. That's not just when you're free. That's at all times. The the wa there could indicate that this is for all times, but act on it when you're free. Because obviously if you're not free, if you're busy with certain dunyawi things, then that's what you're busy with and there's nothing wrong with that. So that's pretty fascinating, subhanAllah. There's another way of reading this ayah, it is, وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرَغِّبْ So this is a, a more rare reading, but it's still, it's a valid reading, which means what? Attract people to Allah. That not just have longing for Allah, but make others long for Allah too. So it's, 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 it's the difference between lazim and muta'addi, which is a fancy way of saying instead of for yourself longing to Allah, make others long for Allah, make people attracted to Allah. So in other words, if you put both meanings together, you should be longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making such a, an example of yourself that other people say, I need to be like that. So both come together at the same time. This is the way the Qur'an works, subhanAllah, that you take multiple perspectives and you see how they all work together so beautifully. That, yes, indeed, the Prophet there's a beautiful hadith in this regard. ضَحِكَ رَبُّنَا عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ قُنُوتِ عِبَادِهِ وَقُرْبِ غَيْرِهِ غِيَرِهِ Sorry. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَيَضْحَكُ الرَّبْ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم فَقُلْتُ لَنْ نَعْدَمَ مِنْ رَبٍ يَضْحَكُ خَيْرًا That the Prophet said, our Lord laughs at the despair of his servants that they feel uh, at, at, at the feeling of, of despair when his help is so close. So Allah Ta'ala laughs at the one, you're, the help is so close. وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ uh, What's it called? Uh, فإذ, uh, what's it called? Um, فإنما على العسر يسرى the, 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 It's so close. And you feel so sad, but it's right there around the corner. So it's saying that Allah laughs at this. That subhanAllah, uh, He laughs at the, at the one who, he's in such despair, but he has no idea that everything's going to be fixed in just a moment. And then the person, uh, Laqeet, the person asking, he says, Oh Messenger of Allah, does our Lord laugh? And the Messenger وسلم, said, Yes, indeed. And then he said, he, he reported, he said, I said, in that case, we will never give up hope of receiving good from a Lord that laughs. In other words, this was so, he, he appreciated the concept. Now obviously, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى In a way that befits His Majesty. We can't imagine it. 
You know, it's not like us, right? Nothing is like him. Nothing in this dunya, nothing in this worldly realm is like him. But still, it gives an implication. It gives a feeling, it gives an idea. That subhanAllah, it shows the love and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yahya ibn Mu'ad, rahimullah, he has a nice quote. He says what? عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ خَوْفِكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ يَهَابُكَ الْخَلْقِ وَعَلَىٰ قَدْرِ حُبِّكَ لِلَّهِ يُحِبُّكَ الْخَلْقِ وَعَلَىٰ قَدْرِ شُغْلِكَ بِاللَّهِ يَشْتَغِلِ الْخَلْقِ بِأَمْرِكَ What a good quote this is. SubhanAllah. Yahya ibn Mu'ad, rahimullah, he says what? Your honor amongst the creation is relative to your fear of Allah. And the creation's love for you is relative for your love of Allah. And how much the creation works for you is relative to how much you work for Allah. So if you want honor, have fear of Allah. And then it's going to be relative. You more you love Allah, then the creation is not just going to honor you, but they're also going to love you. And then furthermore, how much you work for the sake of Allah, you'll find that the, the, the khalq, the creation of Allah Ta'ala, they will work for you. So this is a beautiful quote, encouraging us and remembering who is in charge and who, create, who controls everything. Allah Ta'ala is indeed in, in control. And how beautiful was the fact that the first three blessings that we mentioned, mentioned alam nashrah laka sadrak, right? Sharh al-sadr. Wad al wizr right, and Raf al dhikr these three blessings that we mentioned in the first three ayat, they went from internal, external to public, right? And then look at these two ayat. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ وَإِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَرْغَبْ These two ayat, first is external. When you are free, as in you don't have any more job to do externally, then I want you to physically exert yourself and your body to stand before Allah and do hard work. So that's all implied, right? So that's the body. But what should your heart be feeling? So the balance between internal and external, it's addressed as well, which is paralleling the beginning of the surah as well. SubhanAllah, something really, really fascinating. Yes. Also, another fascinating point, that you find that there's a correlation between one's reputation being elevated and praying at night. Right? So this, these surahs are ta this surah is talking about what? The importance of worshipping Allah in your private moments and how Allah ta'ala like a So you see that these, the these two t concepts are coming together. You worship Allah Ta'ala sincerely, Allah Ta'ala is going to make you an honored creation. This same, these two, same two concepts, they come together in another surah, in Surah Al-Isra. Allah says what? وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبَعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا Allah is saying what? And from part of the night, pray as additional worship for you. Keep worshiping, not for my sake, but for you. It's more blessing for you. Why? And it is expected that your Lord will resurrect you at a praiseworthy high station. So Allah Ta'ala is connecting these two ayat, these two, these two uh, sorry, concepts. Pray at night more and your status is going to rise. And in this surah, same thing. That you're, and this, this is so fascinating. How many of us, we seek status. I got to right, wear the right clothes. I got to say the right thing. I have to be interesting. I have to drive the right car. I have to have this. I, you know, we work so hard to feel a sense of self-worth, right? To feel like we have a position in this world that people care about us and they respect us and we have some sort of status. SubhanAllah, Allah Ta'ala is telling us what? Over and over again, the message is very clear. You want status with, a, you want to feel like somebody who has honor and status? This is a simple way. Forget about the whole dunya. Turn to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and worship. And you should make a list of everything that is in your heart that you can pour out. Right, that was the theme, to pour out your heart. So make a list of all the things that you can pour out. Think about the things that are your hopes and your aspirations. Think about your gratitude. Think about your curiosities. Think about your fears and anxiety. Think about your stress and your concerns. Bring all of these things that are on your heart and just pour them out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that's what, what faragta. Become empty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful, uh, a very interesting book that I read recently called The Obstacle is the Way. This idea of the obstacle is the way. It's kind of a whole book about stoicism and the, and the importance of you know, being somebody who's tough and somebody who, you know, instead of shying away from challenges, goes towards challenges. And so, you know, don't, when you have free time, don't relax or, pray, or play around. No, this is a time to even push yourself more. So there's a nice quote that says what? Losers embrace their disadvantages as permanent, whereas winners don't accept their bad start. They redefine themselves. So subhanAllah, it's defining the difference between people who typically, you know, they lose versus winners. And so what is the idea? That the loser, he embraces his disadvantages. Oh, well, you know, I wasn't given this, or I had, a, you know, I had this disadvantage, that disadvantage. And they really hold on to that to give themselves the excuse, right? And they hold on to those advantages, disadvantages as if they're permanent, when they don't have to be. Whereas winners, they don't accept their bad start. Even if the, the, the person has the winning attitude, yeah, I had a bad start in life. Maybe my family wasn't rich. Maybe I had certain medical issues. Uh, maybe I wasn't the healthiest person. Maybe I wasn't the most this, that, or the other. But you know what? They don't accept it. They redefine themselves. I, I got over it. I broke it. So this is the importance of, um, of, of working through your obstacles in life 
And, uh, and, and yes, we should always, one of the best ways to remember this is that ultimately our destination is towards Allah. And so I'll mention, a fi- I'll close off with a nice quote from Shakespeare just because I thought it was nice. Every third thought shall be my grave. <laughs> I thought that was pretty powerful. That this is from Shakespeare, that every third thought shall be my grave. In other words, that always remember death. That, you know, after one thought, two thought, the third one is, where am I going to go? Ultimately, I'm going to die. So subhanAllah, even from the Western can- canon, right? There's a Western audience. We're in, the, we're, we're in America, so we can appreciate some of the, you know, Western canon and appreciate even some of the wisdom that is matching ours. Same thing the Romans would say, uh, memento mori. This was a famous Latin expression, which means what? Remember that you have to die. They used to say this regularly, memento mori. This was a quote from amongst the Romans. So anyway, all these points are to say what? That ultimately turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember where our ultimate destination is going. Always have your hopes and aspirations in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and learn to empty yourself for Allah's sake so that you can worship with a full heart. Amin ya Rabbil May Allah ta'ala make us of those who can accomplish all these things. May Allah ta'ala make us of those who worship in the late uh, parts of the night and in all sincerity. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.